community is not a bunch of delinquents, we are students. British rapper Akala is known as much for his political analysis as for his music. You write raps, I write history on the page and quite literally. He grew up in London's Camden in a single parent, low income council house in the late 80s. From the first time he was stopped and searched by police as a child to dealing with gang violence, race and class have shaped Akala's life and outlook. I've lost touch with reality of racism, sexism and nationality. Just to me, all seems like insanity. Why must I rob you of your humanity? Through his art, essays and online talks, he's fast becoming the most dynamic and thought-provoking voice in the UK. In his new book, Natives, he takes his own experiences and widens them to look at the history of racism and where it leaves us today. We've been on this team for so long now. Please welcome Akala. Welcome to the show. You thank might you. have one of the most varied CVs of anyone we've had on the show because apart from all the rap stuff, yeah. which is great, you, you grew up in trouble with the law and rebelling against the system. Ish. Ish. ish, yeah. yeah ish. And now you're teaching history at Oxford University, ish. Ish, yeah. Yeah, yeah both ish. How does yeah. that happen? Um, well, I was very lucky. So when, so my dad's family's from Jamaica, my mum's family's from England and Scotland. When British Caribbeans came to the UK in the post-war period, there was like a special Saturday school movement, Pan-African Saturday school movement, where basically children from lower income, black working class families were given kind of extra support on a Saturday and really had the kind of pressure of their whole community pushing them to do well in school. So I had this real contradiction of growing up around lots of negative experiences, but loads of really positive ones too. My stepdad was the stage manager of what was London's leading African Caribbean theater, a place called the Hackney Empire. So part of what the book tries to deal with is that yes, on paper, I had all of the kind of tick boxes that should have put me in prison. But then in reality, I also had culturally an incredibly rich upbringing, educationally an incredibly rich upbringing. So I didn't end up where I've ended up today just by coincidence or just because I'm so personally wonderful. Partly I had massive, massive benefits as well as many difficulties. You being personally wonderful was just an added bonus. It was just an added bonus. <laughs> there you go, it was just an added bonus. Right. Yeah. Well, those okay. Saturday classes are part of the, your, your, your turning point because you saw a lot of violence when you were growing up yeah. uh, in your community and at one stage I believe you, you were heading down you know, what we, we might call the wrong path. Yeah. And what, what was the turning point? I don't think there was one single turning point. So the Saturday classes were actually primary school age. So I think what it was is that the teenage age is where the, the, the violence was happening, but I already had a certain amount of preparation that if I suppose I chose to make better decisions, I could have navigated life differently. Also, part of this came because, just because I played football, so I played for West Ham United for five years. When I stopped playing football, I didn't go off to university because it was at the wrong sort of age. So my only friends who were left in the neighborhood were not the ones who went off to university, they were the ones who were naughty. So I sort of fell in with, my bad friends, if you like. And, and again, that's too simplistic. But I think in a way that's given me a unique perspective because most people who are academics or historians often don't have real life experience, even those who are on the left, of some of the things that they're talking about. So in a way, obviously, it's easy to be philosophical in hindsight, but it's given me a benefit of lived experience plus, you know, self-taught academic, uh, academic research to back it up. So if you, if you, again, if you read the book, you'll see that I'm very empirical. I don't kind of make broad brushstroke assumptions just based on my experiences. I place my experiences in historical, political, evidential context with tens of thousands of pages worth of citations. Mm. The world is an increasingly multicultural place. Yeah. And yet so often it feels like we're going backwards when it comes to race relations. Why do you think that is? I don't necessarily think that's entirely true in the sense that a, the world has always encompassed a multitude of cultures. What's happening is the industrial developed West is becoming increasingly multicultural or multi-ethnic. Britain, for example, was never one singular culture. My mum's Celtic family, English is not even their first language. But when we say ethnic minorities, we obviously don't mean the Celts or the Welsh. We mean brown people. Um, and I'm not, I'm not sure it's as simple as backwards or forwards. There are periods of enormous progression, depending on what political ideologies are dominant, depending... You know, there's a discussion, I suppose there's a tug of war, and sometimes it feels like the more negative forces, or what I would hope we would all assume are negative forces, are, are winning and things are going in their favour, and in, in other senses it feels like there's some positive change. Broadly, though, over the last century, the world has got a hell of a lot better. I mean, if you think where we were 100 years ago, virtually the entire planet was a European colony or a colony of Ottoman Turkey. You know, race was fully accepted as scientific. Women couldn't vote yet. So I think it's important to be cognizant of the massive ways in which 
the world has actually improved across the last century and generally, even while recognising the dangers that the tragedies of the past can easily repeat themselves. We're not so enlightened that things are guaranteed to always get better. On your music, it's I'm told it's pretty politically charged. I'm not a huge rap fan myself, yeah. but all right. does that, that, that mean... That may shock you. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, sure, <laughs> I'm sure that would surpri <laughs> surprise you. I am surprised. Yeah, I am. <laughs> does it get played on mainstream radio? No, no. So what's really fascinating where I've... Cos I've always been independent as well, so I'm not on a major label, but in the UK, for the first sort of 10 years of my career, I wasn't really on the radio and I wasn't even really on TV discussing politics and stuff. YouTube came along and I'd also been building a steady live fan base. So I got to a point where we could do a really, really healthy amount of tickets live in London. Got to a point where I had a really big sort of online fan base. And it was only then that the mainstream media started saying, OK, well, it's going to look really bad if we sort of don't have this guy on. So really it was fan led and it was supporter led rather than mainstream media led. I mean, my first mixtape came out in 2004. I mean, my first album was 2006, so I've been around a little while. Yep. Mixtape? Wow, how long has it been since you heard that? <laughs> exactly, exactly yeah. incredible. We have no time for this question, so just very quickly, I know you're a footballer. Who wins the Premier League? Manchester City. Oh, get out of here. <laughs> the book is called Natives, Race and Class in the Ruins of Empire.